Hi, I'm Em from 21 Readers, and this video is going to be a reading blog for my Book of the Month March picks. All of my March picks were thrillers. I had two main picks and one add-on. In this video, I'm going to be reading Murder Road by Simone St. James, Listen for the Lie by Amy Tintera, and Kill for Me, Kill for You by Steve Cavanaugh. Enjoy the vlog. This is my 50% update for Murder Road by Simone St. James. Right now it feels like a three star, however a new character was just introduced that's making me intrigued for the second half. This book takes place in the 90s and it follows a newly married couple on the way to their honeymoon. They're driving at night on a highway and a hitchhiker comes to their car in the first chapter and when they let her in the car they realize she's severely wounded so they take her to the hospital and she ends up dying. So this couple who was just trying to help out the hitchhiker ends up accused of her murder. And so the book is mainly about us figuring out who this woman was, and it turns out that there are many hitchhikers that have been murdered over the years on this specific road. This author always includes a supernatural element to her books, and the chapters in this book with the supernatural element have been the most creepy and the most enjoyable. However, there are two things that are kind of hindering my enjoyment of the book overall. One is the main character, and two is how formulaic the book is to her other books. The main character falls into a trope we've seen many times in thrillers where we have our main character who didn't come from a lot of money, she's estranged from her parents, so she's kind of on her own, and we don't really have anything making her more interesting or new than this trope, so she's a pretty general caricature or archetype of that character. So I'm not really invested in the characters. I'm mainly just invested in the supernatural elements, which leads me into how this book is quite similar to her other books. Her most three recent books before this are The Book of Cold Cases, The Sundown Motel, and The Broken Girls, and they're all very similar. We have a supernatural element, we have a murder mystery at the center, we have detectives involved, and we have the boyfriend or the husband helping our main character figure out what actually happened. And the whodunit of the murder mystery is always somehow tied to the supernatural ghost getting closure in the afterlife. So all of them are pretty similar and hit the same beats. They're just in different settings and time periods. Whenever I start not enjoying the story and instead comparing it to her other books and how similar they are, I can tell it's going to be hard to bounce back from that. And then I got to thinking that a lot of murder mysteries are similar, but this one just seems so similar that you would think this author would lean into the supernatural elements more since those are the most original scenes compared to other thriller books. But the supernatural elements, those chapters are few and far between, and I can't help just reading to get to the next supernatural chapters. So between this character that we've seen before, these beat-by-beat -beat thrillers we've seen before, this book isn't really doing anything that fresh or original. All this to say, between the flat characters and the beat by beat way the plot is unfolding and how we're only getting short glimpses of the supernatural elements, I'm not really enjoying this one. It's just going to be fine. I'm not actively disliking it. It's just boring and I know probably going to be forgettable. However, I do have high hopes that maybe the twist of how the supernatural element is related will maybe bump us up to a four, but right now it's feeling like a solid three. Next we have my 50% thoughts for Listen for the Lie by Amy Tentera. This one feels like a four star right now. This one's a podcast adult thriller where our main character is the topic of a popular true crime podcast because of her being accused of her friend's death, and so she goes back to her small town where she grew up to rehash what happened. This book is this author's adult debut. She's previously written YA and that was good because I wasn't doing like I was with Murder Road comparing her previous thrillers. However, the fact that she's doing the podcast thing did make me inevitably compare this adult thriller to other thrillers that I've done podcasts. Specifically, I was comparing it to None of This is True, which was a podcast book of the month thriller last year. And I was also comparing it to A Good Girl's Guide to Murder just because if you ask me what the best podcast thriller book is, that one comes to mind, despite that one being YA. Even though I wasn't comparing this book to this author's previous books, I was definitely thinking, is the podcast element of this really helping the story or not? And at the 50% mark, I'm thinking it's not really adding intrigue. I think it's done a little sloppily, actually, because we have a podcast clip between each chapter. And sometimes the people that the podcast host is interviewing hasn't been introduced on page in the story and so I don't know who we're even interviewing and it's a lot of women so all of the women are getting blurred together in my head and I'm not sure if I should be remembering what's happening in the podcast or if the purpose of the chapters are just to make the reader feel like how much the community is gossiping about this or how much they didn't like our main character. So at this point I think it's just sloppy the way that the podcast is done however I do think the element of this podcast host 
coming to the hometown to do his interviews is adding to the story because that feels more original because we don't have the typical woman goes back to her hometown and is rehashing this case. We have, oh, everybody is acting this sort of way to the characters, but they're acting this way when the podcaster talks to them. I do think that the man, the podcast host coming to town is adding to the story and is adding to my enjoyment and suspense. However, I don't think the actual inclusion of the podcast chapters in between chapters is helping the story. So that's why some parts of the podcast story are helping, some are hindering. I do have a theory about who it's going to be, and I'm hoping I'm right. So that's the main reason that I think this could be bumped up to a five, depending on this ending. The ending, I could see this going multiple ways, and I'm hoping that the payoff is there. Another thought I have about the main character is she has this sense of humor that's dry and witty, and sometimes I think it makes her stand out, and sometimes I'm thinking that her tone of voice is unnecessary. So I think that's being done intentionally to kind of get the point across that this isn't our typical likable main character. She's pretty unliked by most people in the story. And for that reason, I do like that our main character stands out, particularly contrasting my comment about Murder Road, how that was such a bland main character. I'll take an unlikable main character if she stands out even if sometimes the reading in her head gets a little bit grating. So I'm liking it. I'm not loving it. The podcast isn't perfect and I'm not 100% sold on this needing to be a podcast book. I definitely wonder if people who actually like true crime podcasts like podcast thrillers more than people that don't listen to true crime podcasts. I'm not a true crime podcast person. So I don't think it's adding much, but we'll see. I think this could be a five star depending on the ending. Next, we have my 50% thoughts for Kill For Me, Kill For You by Steve Cavanaugh. The 50% mark left me at one of my favorite plot twists I've read in a long time. And right now, this feels like a five star book. This one takes place in New York. I think within the mystery thriller genre, this one's more specifically a crime thriller. We're following our main character who is a widow. She's lost both her husband and her daughter. And she's trying to kill the person that she thinks killed her daughter and she's not able to execute that kill but then she meets somebody that's willing to do it for her and so hence the title kill for me kill for you because she's gonna kill somebody else related to the other woman and then the other woman's gonna kill the person who killed her daughter so of these three books this first half of this book has been the most engaging and most fun I've had. It's also incredibly original. I can't really compare it to any other thriller that I've read in recent years. And the plot twist that just hit at the 50% mark is probably my favorite plot twist that I've read in the past year. I really hope that the second half can live up to the first half because the first half was absolutely a five star. I'm definitely wondering how the pacing is going to be in the second half and if the twists and the payoff is going to live up to this first half. Even though we're following two women, we have four POVs two are from men. I think those could be cut out because I think it's affecting the pacing. So we'll see if this one ends up staying a five star. I'm hoping the second half lives up to the first half. I have now finished all three of my book of the month thrillers for March. So I'm going to move into my 100% updates for all of them. Starting with Murder Road, I'm giving this a three star. Even though the pacing of the reveals was better than her last book and the way that things were connected were a little bit more meaningful, Ultimately, this one was pretty forgettable, particularly our main character and our main couple. And even though the supernatural element was unique, it didn't make this book stand out more than her other supernatural books. And this isn't one I'm going to be recommending to people. I think if the supernatural element is going to be the standout, make those scenes more frequent in the book. And if you're going to rely on the emotional core of the characters, make the character more unique or emotionally compelling and not so much of a caricature that we see in thriller books all the time. My updated rankings for Simone St. James books are going to be The Sundown Motel first, then The Broken Girls, then Murder Road, and then The Book of Cold Cases. The Book of Cold Cases had pacing issues, I remember, and I didn't really think that the second half of that book worked, whereas I think the second half of this book was stronger just because pieces of the puzzle were starting to fit together in a way that I wasn't expecting. So for that reason, even though I do have a lot of complaints about this book, I'm keeping it at a three and not a two because I was intrigued in how everything was going to come together. It's just, it was ultimately forgettable and the supernatural elements weren't used as much as I thought they could have. And particularly as we're comparing to the other books in this video, the characters at the center were dull and that's something I've noticed as I've become more picky with my mystery thrillers over the years is that I do need to have some buy-in with the characters beyond just the suspense and the plot twist. And this is a pretty dull main character. If you've been curious about supernatural thrillers but you're not sure if it's something you would like, I think this book would be a good place to start since the supernatural element isn't that overbearing and it's told in an accessible way. It's not confusing and it's not diving into creepy horror territory that would be 
scary. It's more just creepy for the characters and suspenseful, but just in short snippets. So I think this would be a good place to start if you're wanting a thriller with supernatural elements and you haven't tried it. Next is Listen for the Lie 100% update. I'm giving this four stars and I'm disappointed by that rating. I thought this could have gotten bumped up to a five, but why didn't it? For a few reasons. One is mainly the ending. I mentioned in my original update that I thought the podcast element was done a bit sloppily, wherein the podcast episodes in between chapters were throwing in new characters we hadn't met yet, or making it seem like more things were happening than were actually happening, and making it seem not as focused in terms of who are we suspecting here. All that to say, I was willing to look past my critiques with the podcast element if this ending blew me away and this ending not only did it not blow me away it was disappointing all that build up for that ending i don't want to say it was predictable but it seemed like it was almost like the author carefully plotted this podcast and these characters but didn't really know what the ending was going to be and then she just picked somebody and thrillers like that where they didn't lead us to what actually happened it almost makes me want to do a reread knowing the ending, but I don't think that a reread would help because I think my original criticism of the podcast being sloppy stands. Maybe I would reread just the podcast element. I don't think if I was a listener of this podcast, if this podcast was real, I would be able to piece together the whodunit of it all. And as someone who read the book, does the ending make sense? In the book, the podcast host never really asserts his opinion on what happened. He more just conveys other people's opinions. He doesn't make his own opinions. It almost seems like the author was using restraint to not lead the reader and didn't really give us any action scenes or any hints until the end where it got movie villainly bad, like unrealistically bad. I think the main issue is the podcast element was not done as crisply as it could have been. And same with the ending. It seemed like the ending wasn't laid out for us. And whenever I spend time in a thriller and then the ending is just random, specifically the whodunit of it all is random, it kind of makes me wonder why we were even here all along. But the pros of this book are... I did think this one was unique. I thought that this was a nice take on a woman goes back to her hometown and she doesn't really like anybody, but the fact that we have this new blood with this new character of the podcaster made it seem more fresh. I like that the crime wasn't in high school. I like that the crime was when they were in their early 20s, just after college or while they were still in college. Because a lot of these books where the main character goes back to her hometown, the crime happened when they were in childhood or in high school. So I thought the fact that they were older felt like it was doing something a little bit new on the take as well. I think if we're comparing 2024 Book of the Month thrillers, from authors where it's their first th adult thriller and they used to write YA. First Lie Wins is a much better thriller compared to Listen for the Lie. However, I'm still glad I read this and I do think it's above average, hence why I'm giving it a four star, but it's not a new favorite. However, if I'm comparing it to that other book of the month thriller author, Kate Alice Marshall, What Lies in the Woods and No One Could Know, those ones were both similar with the main character going back to her hometown with a crime that was committed in her childhood. And I think this book, Listen for the Lie, was better than both of those books, What Lies in the Woods and No One Can Know. So if you were let down by those books or thought they were just average, this book I think was better. The podcast element, some parts of it worked for me, some parts of it didn't work for me. I think if you're into true crime podcasts, you would like this. I think if you want somewhere to start with podcast adult thrillers, this would be a good one to start with. The other podcast adult thriller I mentioned, No One Can Know, I had also given a four star. It's a bit hard to compare that one to this one since the stories are so different. I do think we're winding down on the true crime podcast element in thrillers. At least I hope we're winding down. I would recommend this if you're looking for a new thriller author that you haven't tried and you're running a podcast element. If you like the trope of woman goes back to her hometown to rehash a crime from her past, I think this one is a fun read despite the ending being disappointing for me. And finally, we have my 100% update for Kill For Me, Kill For You, which, speaking of disappointing endings, this one also had, unfortunately. I was feeling like this was going to be a five-star book at my 50% update, and this one is getting bumped down to a four. The first half had some of my favorite plot twists that I've read in the past year. However, the execution of the second half went downhill. I think it maybe was a combination of pacing, because the book seemed to come to a halt after the big plot twist at the halfway point, but then when we got to this final sequence of events, it felt almost rushed. And 
This character is going through a lot of grief. This is the one who lost her daughter and husband. And we wrap things up very quickly. I think I would have liked some more emotional closure from that character. We do get some, but it seemed rushed. And the way that all the point of views tied together was plotted very meticulously, which I enjoyed. However, we were trying to tie up all these loose ends at the end. And while it was a longer thriller, I think it could have been a little bit longer just so we could wrap up the story because the book was so carefully plotted and edited and so that we had short chapters and that we kept reading. But then the ending just kind of halted in its tracks, which was a letdown. And I think the pacing overall in the second half wasn't my favorite. I really thought this was going to be a five star, but we didn't keep the five star feeling the whole book only on the first half another thing this is more on the nitpicky side not a reason that i gave it four stars but this book was marketed as being set in new york i remember like in the description either on book of the month website or goodreads it mentioned new york but it was pretty obvious that this author was from the uk and that they just changed details to make it in new york when i think it really could have been any nondescript city i don't really know why the marketing fixated on the new york of it all because it was pretty obvious they just changed words because there would be random locations sprinkled in sometimes that weren't relevant. And then whenever there was a news article mentioned, which was actually kind of frequent, it was always in the New York Post. Why were we always using the same source or just don't say what the source was or just say a newspaper? And then I was catching on to some vocabulary that we don't use in the US that I went and looked up to think, is this a British word? For example, he uses the phrase walking frame, which we don't say in the US. And I looked it up and that's what they call walkers in the UK. So I was getting a little bit nitpicky by the language used here. And I definitely think we could have just not even specified what city it was in because it being in New York wasn't necessarily relevant. Anyway, that was more of a nitpicky thing, not really a criticism, but I'm definitely wondering if other people noticed differences because this book was originally published in the UK in 2023 and then was published in the US this year, I guess, with some changes with the location and some of the vocab used. I think the reason I was fixating on these things is because I remember in my original March book of the month video, I wasn't sure if I wanted to try this author. I typically read female thriller authors, but I was willing to give this one a try. But between the two male POVs, that didn't really seem necessary. And the New York changes, I was definitely wondering if I would read another book from this author. I think I would just because I was so intrigued by this plot setup, but I would only read another book from this author if I was intrigued by the plot setup because that's something that I will take away from this is that it was incredibly original and I'm happy I read an original thriller. So overall, I would recommend this one if you want an original story. This setup was incredibly fun and this was a pretty fast paced read. So even if you typically only read female thriller authors this one is an above average thriller i would still recommend this one and i gave this one and listen for the lie both four stars so getting into my rankings of this video my favorite was kill for me kill for you which i gave four stars my second favorite was listen for the lie which i gave four stars and my third favorite was murder road which i gave three stars those were my march book of the month thrillers that i read tell me in the comments your thoughts on these books and i'll see you in the next one bye